Welcome to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. As a veteran senior pastor, Dr. Sullivan understands the importance of Bible teaching in the spiritual growth and development of God's people. Dr. Sullivan's method of teaching the Bible is to read and carefully explain each chapter and verse in clear and understandable terms so the student of the Bible gains the full understanding of God's Word. Now prepare yourself to learn and grow as Dr. Sullivan teaches through the Bible. Welcome to another session of Teaching Through the Bible. I'm Dr. Kenneth Sullivan. Well, today we're beginning a brand new study in the Bible. We're beginning the uh, Book of Romans, uh, and we're beginning with Chapter 1. But before we get into this great book of Romans, let me give you a little background information on this great book. The author of the book, of course, is the Apostle Paul, as is stated in verse 1 uh, of this great letter. Romans was probably written in A.D. 57 from the city of Corinth, again by Paul. Now, most of Paul's letters um, were to churches that he had founded, um, but Paul was not the founder of the church at Rome. He was uh, actually had never even had the opportunity to go to Rome, though he'd wanted to go, get there several times, but he was prevented. The Church of Rome was probably founded by other Christians who came and settled there. Now, uh, Paul's letter to the saints at Rome did not focus on correcting church problems as his other letters, most of his other letters did. Um, he talked to the Romans about the plan, God's plan of salvation and redemption. And Roman expresses the significance of the sacrificial offering of Jesus Christ and how God extends his righteousness to everyone uh, through faith in Christ. Paul's purpose for writing the book of Romans was to glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to teach the doctrines of the Christian faith, and to build up and encourage the saints in their faith. The book of Romans stresses the need for righteousness, um, for, the, uh, for how to obtain faith, faith, or how to attain righteousness and salvation, and Paul stresses that it is only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul taught that God the Father provided a way for sinners to receive forgiveness of their sins, justification, and the power to live righteously through faith in Christ and uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul boldly points out that the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for us is the very power of God by which everyone can be saved. That's Romans 1.16. So let's jump right into this study. Uh, Romans chapter 1, and I'm reading in the New Living Translation, verses 1 through 4. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul opens his letter by asserting his apostleship and the fact that like the other apostles, he was chosen by God. Now, because he was one of the uh, was not one of the original apostles, uh, Paul's apostleship was sometimes challenged, and so uh, he was compelled to assert the fact that uh, he was one of the apostles of Jesus Christ. Um, when Paul says he is a bond servant or a slave of Jesus Christ, he is expressing his complete and utter devotion to Christ. As an apostle and a servant of God, Paul was sent to preach the good news about God's son, Jesus Christ. In his opening statement, he makes uh, several important points. Number one, that this good news or this gospel is about Jesus Christ. Number two, Jesus Christ is the son of God in his divinity, but a descendant of David in his humanity. And number three, this good news is, uh, is not something new. It was promised long ago by the prophets in the scriptures. Now, throughout the Old Testament, the prophets had predicted that the Messiah or the Christ, uh, the words mean the same thing, uh, uh, Messiah from the Hebrew and Christ from the Greek. 
Um, but the Old Testament prophets predicted that the Messiah would come into the world and bring salvation and deliverance. Each prophet gave a bit of information about the coming Messiah and what he would do. The, uh, the Jewish people studied these scriptures and uh, pieced them together, trying to get a full picture of, uh, of, of what Christ or the Messiah would be like and uh, things like when he would come and, and how uh, to identify him and, and what he would do when he came. So they looked into the scriptures, they searched through the scriptures, and they got a partial picture of Christ but not a, a complete picture of Christ. Now, one such scripture from the book of Isaiah chapter 11 um, um, states this, and Isaiah wrote of the Messiah. Uh, he says, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. And that day the wolf and the lamb will live together. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them all. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. In that day... The heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. That's Isaiah 11 and 1 through 10 that I just read, read in the New Living Translation. Now, this passage from Isaiah uh, encompasses both the first and the second comings of Christ to the earth, um, but without distinguishing between these, uh, these times. Now, these kinds of prophecies cause the, the uh, Jewish priests and scribes and rabbis to to think that Christ or the Messiah would come and bring deliverance uh, and the new kingdom upon the world all at one time. Jesus had to teach his apostles that he would come and offer his body as a sacrifice to save uh, whoever would believe in the world, um, that he would be crucified, that he would rise again and return to heaven, and that he, he would uh, give his followers more than 2,000 years to grow into a worldwide body of believers, and then he would return again and take over the world. Um, now, he would uh, come back to the world, establish his kingdom, rule it in peace and righteousness. But most of, uh, most of this was not clearly understood by the uh, uh, by the scribes and the people who studied the scripture until Jesus came and showed it to his disciples from the scriptures. Um, many people thought that he would just come and when the Messiah came, uh, he would uh, overthrow whatever ruling government, government was oppressing the Jewish people and that he would establish his kingdom all, in, all at one time. So they were not clear that there would be a, a hiatus, a great hiatus. It's been over 2,000 years now. Uh, from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. Now, Jesus had to explain this to his own, his own disciples, his, his apostles. Uh, and after his resurrection, he explained it to them. St. Luke wrote about this, and he writes this. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering into his glory. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining all the scriptures, uh, explaining from all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And that's Luke 24, 25 through 27 in the New Living Translation. So Jesus had to pull them aside because after he'd been with them for all of this time, teaching them, then he died and then he'd rose, uh, he, he rose again from the, from the dead they were still bewildered. And Peter asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, and of course, Jesus at that time said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that God has uh, in his hands, but you shall receive power. Of course, this was his, his teaching them before uh, he died. And then after he died, he had to sit down with them. He had to go through all the scriptures and explain to them 
uh, all of these things about the Christ, how he would come, how he would suffer, how he would die, how he would rise again, and then how he would go away for a long time, and he'd come again and establish his kingdom. Now, part of Paul's job was to help the saints understand exactly who Jesus was and is. Now, what he has done for us, he needed to explain that uh, and, uh, and how we should respond to what Jesus has done to us, for, for us. Paul makes it clear that Jesus Christ is, of course, the Son of God and was both God and man, both human and divine. He was uh, and is the God-man. As a human being, he was a direct descendant of King David, and Paul made that plain. And the scriptures make that plain. In verse 4, Paul says the proof of Jesus' divinity, that is his godship, the fact that he is divine, that he is God, was the fact that he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he declares, Paul declares, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now I'm reading verses 5 through 7. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I'm writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So God chose Paul specifically for the task or for the job of telling Gentiles, that is non-Jewish people, all non-Jewish people are Gentiles. Paul's job was to tell them everywhere, uh, Gentiles everywhere, what uh, God has done, what Christ did uh, upon the cross and, and his body and, and all of the things that, per, that pertain to Christ. Uh, once they were told this good news, <clears throat> then they could believe and obey him. Their faith would produce obedience, and this obedience to God would bring him glory. Paul said. Now, the whole purpose of, of telling people about God and, and what he has done um, is so that they can understand it, hear it, and believe in the true God and what he has done for them. And then they can call upon God to save them and to help them to obey him. Paul wrote in chapter 10 of Romans, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? So faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. That's Romans 10, 13, 14, and 17. So Paul's job was to tell unbelievers about Christ and what he has done. Then they could believe and be saved. Of course, Paul also went on to teach the great doctrines of the faith, but he was a proclaimer of the gospel, and that's how people entered into salvation. Now, Paul assures the Roman saints that they have been included among the, all of the Gentiles that God loves, that uh, they were chosen and called to be his own holy people. And, and then Paul prays for, for them that God's grace and peace would be upon them. Now I'm reading verses 8 through 12. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you, for I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. So Paul expresses his gratitude to God for their strong faith. Uh, and um, the saints were constantly, the saints at Rome, and all of the saints, of course, but he is speaking to the saints at Rome. They were constantly on his mind, on his heart. He was constantly praying for them. He prayed for their, their natural, uh, practical needs, and he also prayed for their spiritual needs. Now, one of the things that Paul wanted most was to have the opportunity to, to uh, visit them in Rome. He had 
not had that opportunity to get to Rome, and, and he had planned to visit them on several occasions, but circumstances prevented it. It would not be until he was arrested in Jerusalem and he appealed to Caesar that he would actually get the chance to go to Rome, and then he would be under guard, under arrest. Now, it's inspiring to see um, uh, how much Paul loved and devoted himself to a church that he had uh, never had the opportunity to visit, people he had, he had never seen or spoken to in person. Uh, it's a reflection of his deep understanding of the unity that exists in the body of Christ. Paul understood the universal nature of God's church on earth and, and the fact that true Christians are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul was a Jew by nationality, but uh, he understood that the Gentile Christians in Rome and all over the world were as much his brothers and sisters uh, as his Jewish Christian brothers and sisters were. We Christians uh, are often divided in our minds by physical location, by ethnicity, by a denominational affiliation. Um, we're so divided that we, that we fail to understand the bond that exists uh, the brotherhood and the sisterhood that we share with true Christians all over the world of, of virtually every uh, denomination. Paul expressed it this way in his letter to the Galatians. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's Galatians 3, 28 in the New Living Translation. So it doesn't matter what you're color is, what your denominational affi affiliation is, where you're located, we're all part of one great family, the family of God. And we need to realize that. It's my prayer that um, I hope I get to live to see it, uh, where there will be a complete breakdown of, of uh, racial separation among the Christians, of uh, ethnic separation among the Christians, of denominational separation among the Christians, that we will really come to understand that we are the family of God and that our bond transcends every other uh, relationship on earth. Paul longed for the opportunity to preach and teach to the saints at Rome that he loved so much. And he wanted to build up their faith with the gifts that God had given him uh, to, to do so. He wanted to encourage and, and build them up in their faith, but, but he also wanted to receive encouragement from them. Um, Whenever a person ministers to the needs of others, he or she is also refreshed and encouraged. It, it, it uh, redounds to them or rebounds to them. Whatever you put out there to bless and minister to others, uh, we reap it. We really do reap what we sow. Preachers and teachers are refreshed and encouraged when they minister to others. And Proverbs 11.25 says, those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And of course now, Proverbs was speaking specifically about being generous to people, but we can be generous in how we uh, uh, reach out to help and to encourage and to strengthen other people, and that will come back to us. If you give joy, you'll receive joy. If you give encouragement, you'll receive encouragement. If you give strength, you'll receive strength. So we should be about our Father's business doing good. Now I'm reading verses 13 through 15. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit just as I've seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and uneducated alike. So I'm eager to come to you in Rome too, to preach the good news. Paul had a deep desire to go to Rome and minister to the saints. He had heard so much about their faith and he wanted to uh, to be part of contributing to their growth and development, but God had other plans for him at the time. Paul had something to offer to the saints at Rome, uh, and he wanted to bless them by using the gifts that God had given him to preach, to teach, to exhort, and, and to help them to better understand uh, God's word and his purposes for their lives. Um, Paul was a valuable teacher and a preacher, and he could strengthen them or, or could strengthen the Roman saints and advance their walk in Christ 
and uh, cultivate spiritual fruit in their life. Now, every time we sit under an anointed teacher or a preacher and uh, and do it with an, an open and a sincere heart, um, we learn and we grow. Uh, we become better equipped to produce more fruit. Now, sometimes um, that fruit is the work that we're inspired to do uh, uh, from God. Uh, sometimes that fruit is learning better how to do ministry. Sometimes that fruit is greater resolve and determination toward obedience to God. And sometimes that fruit is strength to live more uh, godly and a more righteous life. And and uh, fruit is manifested in many ways in people's lives. And, and God's ministers are tools he uses to increase that fruit. Now I'm reading verses 16 through 17. Well, I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Some people were ashamed to associate with Christians because Christianity was not a religion of high-class people. It was embraced by the lowest classes of people. And in order to become a Christian, the rich, affluent, and high-class people had to humble themselves and embrace and identify with people of low degree. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians. He said these words, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. That's 1 Corinthians 1 26 in the New Living Translation. The, uh, the good news about Christ is the power that God uses to save anyone who believes it. Jewish and non-Jewish people uh, can only be saved by hearing and believing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said he was not ashamed of that gospel. Our only ticket to salvation um, and all that it entails is through believing the good message, the good news of, about Jesus Christ. Paul mentions uh, that it comes to the Jew first, that the Jews receive it first. And he mentions this, that the Jews are first because uh, the, the Jews were the first to receive the oracles of God, or that is the, the knowledge and the information about God. That is the Old Testament scriptures, the, the priesthood and the commandments. Um, the Jewish people were the descendants of Abraham and Christ came through them. But uh, even though they had the first opportunity to receive it, it came to them first, uh, they had to believe the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ like any Gentile in order to be saved. Now, God's means of saving people is through preaching the good news. Preaching is just proclaiming or announcing the, the good news about Christ. And when a person believes uh, that announcement, a miracle of transformation begins in his and or her life. Different cultures have different uh, styles of preaching. African Americans often have a, a more animated and entertaining way, uh, way or style of preaching, while Europeans simply uh, stand and speak, um, sometimes with a raised voice and sometimes not. But the power to save is not in the style or the method. It is in the message. The good news about Jesus Christ is what saves people. And when people hear that, they latch onto it with faith, uh, then they are born again. The, the seed of transformation enters into them. The good news is that God sent his sinless son into the world to offer his body on the cross as a sacrifice uh, to pay for the sins of anyone who would believe, and through faith in Christ Jesus, the believer is made right with God. He receives forgiveness of sins, freedom from slavery to sin, and eternal life. That is the essence of the, of the gospel or the good news about Jesus Christ. That is the power of God that he uses to save the person who hears it. In verse 17, Paul says, 
The good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. Then he adds that we are made right by faith in Jesus Christ uh, and, and in Jesus Christ alone. We are made right when we believe the good news about Jesus Christ. I don't think I can say that too, too much. Um, the gospel message is summarized in John 3.16. In the King James Version, it reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, the, the proof of true faith is a changed life and a deep desire to obey God and do what's right. People who claim to believe the gospel but do not change do not have real living faith. James 2 and 17 says, faith without works is dead. So to be truly saved is to be converted, which means to be changed. Paul said, Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That's Philippians 2, 12 and 13, and I read in the New Living Translation. The process of conversion begins in the life of a true believer right away. This is not to say that there won't be some struggles in some areas of your life. Some areas change immediately. Some changes take place more gradually, but the process of change or conversion begins in, a, in an instant in, 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 in a believer's life, the instant that we believe. Now I'm reading verses 18 through 20. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Paul says the creation itself is a witness to the fact that the creator exists. In verse 20, he says, through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Everything natural Every natural thing in the world is proof of the creator. The fact that we live in a world of order instead of chaos tells us that our creator is a God of order. Certain physical laws govern our planet and our universe, and we can rely on those laws to remain constant and steady. Gravity keeps us and everything else from floating off into space. The earth is shielded from the sun's harmful radiation by a layer of ozone. Um, there is plant and animal life that provides food for everything on this planet. All of these things testify of a thoughtful and caring God who created and sustains it. Not long after creation, people began to suppress the truth of God by, by making idols of wood and stone and other materials often in the likeness of people and animals, uh, and then giving those things credit as being the creator. They created false religious systems of worship uh, around these idols that often included human sacrifices. They glorified these false gods and gave them the credit of being the creator. Even the Israelites did that. Um, today, evolutionists are just as superstitious uh, as the idol worshipers were because they say that there is no God. They claim that this complex world and universe just sprang into existence by random chance and is sustained by that same accidental um, occurrence or random chance. Both groups, the idol worshipers uh, and the evolutionists, suppress the truth of God. Now I'm reading verses 21 through 23. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. The idol worshipers and the evolutionists both willfully uh, are willfully ignorant and uh, self-willed. 
Rather than giving glory to God, they both came up with alternatives to the truth and created great followings of people who believed their fables. The result of refusing to acknowledge God or worship him uh, it, and it's turning to something beside God and turning to something beside God is a, it's a foolish uh, and darkened mind. That's the result. God just allows your mind to go into darkness. These people became superstitious and wicked in their minds and in their actions, and they made up all of these false things and, and even believed it. Now I'm reading verses 24 through 27. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise, amen. That's why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. So God is the one who gives us a conscience about what is right and wrong. So Paul is informing us of what happens when, when people reject the knowledge of God and choose to credit something else in place of God. Paul looks back in history uh, of such in the history of such cases and tells what happened to them in history, in his past history, beyond him. In verse 24, he says, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. God released them from any conscience about right or wrong so they were able to indulge their basest passions without a twinge of conscience. Paul says they lost the natural attractions and desires for people of the opposite sex and began to have desires and passions for people of the same sex. There are a number of these cases where whole communities were given over to unnatural affections and desires. Uh, most people immediately think of the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah as recorded in, in uh, Genesis chapter 19. Uh, and it is indeed one of the most classic cases. But in Leviticus chapter 19, uh, God gave a long list of uh, sins, including incest, um, that the Canaanites were guilty of engaging in because they had, uh, they had no conscience uh, uh, because of the things that they had done, because of the, thing that they, because of the fact that they had turned away from God and rejected him. Um, uh, all kinds of uh, perversions came upon them. And so God warned the Israelites not to follow their example. Leviticus chapter 19 says, Do not permit any of your children to be offered as a sacrifice to Molech, for you must not bring shame on the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not practice homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman. It is a, it is a detestable sin. A man must not defile himself by having sex with an animal, and a woman must not offer herself to a male animal to have intercourse with it. This is a perverse act. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the people I'm driving out before you have defiled themselves in these ways. Because the entire land has become defiled, I'm punishing the people who live there. I will cause the land to vomit them out. That's, a, that's Leviticus um, chapter 19, verses 21 through 25. Now, both Moses in Leviticus and Paul in Romans describes homosexuality as a consequence of a society of people rejecting the knowledge of God. May not have necessarily been the consequence of the sin of the individual that causes people to lose natural affection um, and uh, attractions and uh, natural sexual desires. It could be the consequence of the sins of society. Adam and Eve, for example, uh, sinned in the garden. And so the consequences of their sins fell upon us. It wasn't something that we did personally. Uh, it was something that they did, and the consequence of their sin fell upon, upon the world. Now, in order to gain forgiveness and freedom, I want to say that God loves everybody. Whatever your sin is, God loves you, and he loves us so much that he sent his son 
as a means of, of our escaping the, uh, the bondage and the slavery to all kinds of sin. In order to gain forgiveness and freedom from slavery to sin, we have to believe the good news about Christ and be converted or born again. But whether the sin is homosexuality or heterosexual sins like adultery or sex before marriage, God can transform a person who turns to Christ in faith. In verse 26 of our text, Paul said, men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Paul said the homosexual practice and lifestyle is a penalty within itself because it goes against nature and it is self-destructive behavior. When Paul wrote this letter, homosexual sex and same-sex marriage was a common practice, especially in Rome. The Roman emperor Nero uh, was a homosexual. So Paul was going against the grain when he called out this sin and exposed the reason for its existence. Now, I'm reading verses 28 through 32 at this time. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things they should never that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse, to under, uh, they refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. So Paul gives a long list of demoralizing sins that consume the lives of people who rejected the knowledge of God and thought acknowledging him was foolishness. It wasn't the homosexual act that was the only thing that happened to those people. They became murderers and swindlers and, and, and all kinds of dark sins lashed itself upon them and upon their society and made their society an unplaced, chaotic place to live. Uh, it was unsafe, and it was uh, um, a violence and all kinds of unstable things that were going on in that society that made it unstable, and, and many of those societies failed. They were invaded, and um, they murdered each other, uh, and they were involved in incest and even human sacrifices, and all of these things happened, and so God judged them. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness and sin. Paul said they had invented new ways of sinning. These sins that Paul lists are the kinds of things that rot a society and create chaos instead of order. They are the kinds of things that finally result in the fall of a nation. Paul said they know that God's justice requires that those who, who do these things deserve to die, but, but then they do them anyway and even encourage others to do it. A, a society becomes inundated with this kind of corruption and sin as a result of rejecting the knowledge of God and refusing to acknowledge him as God. Well, that brings us to the close of Romans chapter 1. Next time we will cover Romans chapter 2. If you live in the, in the Indianapolis area or around the Indianapolis area, I want to invite you to come visit us at one of our services at New Direction Church. Our East Campus is located at 5330 East 38th Street, and our North Campus is located at 7701 East 86th Street. For service times, visit our website at ndcbetterlife.org. Now, until next time, may God bless you and keep you safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for tuning in to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. We hope this program has benefited you in your Christian walk. For a free download of this program and to browse Dr. Sullivan's books, videos, and audio titles, visit our website at EmergeCurriculum.com. Please tune in to our next teaching session on Vision Stream Network or listen on demand from our podcast.